I remember the first time I did heroin like it was yesterday. When I sniffed it, it felt like a powerful, relaxing massage flowing down my body like water. I remember running to the bathroom and throwing up over and over, but I felt so good that I didn't even care. I wouldn't be throwing up the next time I did heroin though. My tolerance grew rapidly. Within months, the constant sickness became an ingrained fear, and eventually, my opiate addiction would take over my entire life. No one ever wakes up in the morning, thinking, I really wish I was a penniless, homeless drug addict. No child ever grows up saying that he wants to be a raging alcoholic or a heroin fiend. No one wants to go to prisons, jails, detoxes, rehabs, mental asylums, or graveyards either. But when the addiction takes over, you don't have a choice of what you will or will not do. When addiction screams at you to jump, you only ask, how high? At a certain point, the idea of going without opiates becomes as instinctually frightening as going without food or water. In fact, a lot of drug addicts would much rather go without food and water than be plunged into the nightmarish, seemingly never-ending withdrawals. An opiate addiction is like having a monkey on your back in some ways. If that monkey was demonic, rabid, and fused into your skin like some sort of sadistic Siamese twin, you know that if you don't do what that monkey says, Says, it will turn its blood red eyes to you in fury. You know that it will claw and bite you until you're curled up in the fetal position on the floor, screaming, please, no more. At a certain point, you don't even want to do the drugs anymore, but there's no real question of it. When the disease has progressed to its final stages, people who are in its grips become like an automaton, a machine. You wake up in the morning, and the addiction screams, come, come, it's time. And even though you've just opened your eyes, you go over. You know you don't want to do drugs anymore, yet you find yourself sitting in front of them anyway. And after years of this, you give up all hope of ever having a life where you're not a soulless puppet, until the only way out in the end seems like death. But not me. In my conscious mind, I knew I didn't have a problem, that I just hadn't figured out the perfect way to control my drug usage yet. My delusion told me that there was some grand middle path where I could get high anytime I wanted, and then stop whenever I felt like it. I just hadn't figured out the perfect way to stop, but I would in time. Of course, this was insanity. After getting kicked out of my apartment and losing my job, I decided it was time to try rehab again. It certainly wasn't my first time there. I had tried everything before, from prison to jail, to rehab, to detox, to methadone, to suboxone, to NA meetings, and plenty of other things. Somehow, I hadn't figured out the perfect method yet, but because my sickness told me I wasn't sick. I was convinced it was only a matter of time. Soon I would just quit and be free of this terrible addiction. But certainly not today. It would always have to be next Tuesday, or maybe next Friday. Next Friday always seems good and reasonable, until it comes and you realize you're still hopeless and on your way to an early grave. Yet, this time was also different in a fundamental way. Because really, at this point, I did want to stop. The party had long ago ended, and now the addiction was a full-time job that paid only in wages of misery and death. So I went to detox for the twelfth time. I suffered the same nightmarish withdrawals as a million times before. Not sleeping for days, feeling my heart racing, seeing my hands and fingers trembling, feeling my stomach doing flips as it debated with itself whether it could hold down any food today. And then, at the end of this madness, the nurse told me there were no beds available in their long-term inpatient rehab, which was a place I knew well, having spent months of my life there previously. So what am I supposed to do? I asked, scowling and furious, I actually wanted to try quitting forever this time, and the universe seemed to be laughing at me. I knew they had a quality rehab program, and I wanted back in it. I wanted to try my best at actually paying attention when they told me about relapse prevention this time. Detox only lasted 4 or 5 days, and that is 
no way enough time for an opiate addict to recover. Someone who just goes to detox and leaves likely has a 99% chance of failure. The admissions nurse with a face like a weary weasel stared impassively through me. I noticed the small ketchup stain on the front of her white uniform. Well, there are no beds available at our unit, she said. I mean, with all this fentanyl crap and all the drug courts, there's a two-month wait list for a 90-day rehab in our unit now. I looked at her, aghast. I'm trying to get rid of a potentially fatal drug addiction here, I said, as if anyone could ever fully get that monkey off their back. People could get sober, yes, but I knew they were always addicts in the pits of their souls, and many only got through life by struggling one day at a time. Well, there is an experimental drug rehab a couple hours away, she said, looking down at a sheet of paper. They contacted us asking for volunteers. They'll cover all costs, including transportation to the facility. What do you mean by experimental drug rehab? I asked, confused. Is this like some new method of quitting drugs? It's not run by the Church of Scientology or anything, right? She laughed at that. No, no, it's nothing like that. Apparently, it's a government-run unit. They want to try out new methods of helping people with severe opiate, addiction, and alcoholism. If you're interested, you can go straight from here tomorrow when you get discharged. I thought about it for a long moment. I nodded at the nurse. All right, sure, I said. I'm willing to try anything. Drugs had finally beaten me into a state of submission. I remembered the first time I went to rehab. I scoffed at their insane 12-step programs and their focus on a higher power. I thought it sounded wacky and I was in no way interested in drinking their Kool-Aid. Now I would listen to absolute anything, try absolutely anything with even the smallest chance of working. Opiates had so successfully dragged me down that I was finally in a state of reasonableness, a fairly rare thing for an addict, and one that usually takes many years to develop. A black SUV pulled up in front of the detox unit the next day. I wasn't the only volunteer they had found apparently. A pretty young blonde girl with ancient, nervous eyes sat next to me as well as some obese guy from Boston with far too many shamrock tattoos on his body and a red Sox cap on his fat, Neanderthal forehead. We all sat in the back. The driver had an opaque black window up, preventing us from seeing him or talking to him. Hi, I'm Haley, the girl said, extending a trembling hand. Her pupils looked large and she looked ill at ease. Though I still wasn't feeling too good, I was immediately interested and shook her hand. I'm Jay, I said, not feeling overly conversational. The Red Sox guy apparently agreed. Simon, the fat man grunted, looking back down at the book he was reading. I saw with interest it was the big book from Alcoholics Anonymous. Do you know anything about this place where we're going? I asked them. Simon just murmured and shook his head. He didn't look like the conversational type. The girl perked up instantly, however. Well, the nurse didn't seem to know much, but I read through that paper they made us sign. Haley said, brushing a lock of her long hair behind her ears. Her perfume reminded me of springtime flowers and mountain peaks. You read the whole thing, I said, surprised. I hadn't read any of it. I wondered whether I had made a mistake. She nodded, the faint trace of a smile playing on the corners of her lips. It's some brand new, totally revolutionary addiction treatment the government has developed in response to all the deaths from fentanyl and heroin lately, she said. Do you know what exposure therapy is? Simon perked up at this. He pushed his glasses up on his nose. I've read about that, he said in a deep voice. That's a way of dealing with phobias, right? Like if someone is afraid of spiders, they show them pictures and videos of spiders to desensitize them, and eventually maybe they put a spider in a cage in front of them. Yeah, pretty much, Haley said. I frowned. I don't get it, I said. What does that have to do with addiction treatment? Are they going to show us pictures of dead bodies from overdoses until we change our minds? Because that doesn't work. I already know that I'll die if I don't stop. I think that, deep down, I've known it for a very long time. Haley just shook her head, bereft of any answers. I have no idea how exposure therapy could apply to addiction treatment. I guess we'll find out when we get there. A couple hours later, we entered a long, winding dirt road. I saw the complex looming out of the top of the rolling New England hills like a knife hilt sticking out of a chest. 
It was garish, massive black towers surrounded by electrified fences and rolls of razor wire greeted us as we pulled up to the gate. Smaller wooden guard towers with observation decks, like fire watch towers, stood at each of the four corners of the square complex. This looks like freaking Guantanamo Bay, Simon observed. He suddenly looked very uncomfortable and nervous. He began shifting his large bulk around the seat. The springs gave an exasperated groan. Then he reached back and gingerly pulled his sweatpants out his rear without any sense of embarrassment. Why do they need all this razor wire? Why the guard towers? I asked. The driver up front finally rolled down the divider. Stay put, guys, the driver said in a nasally, reedy voice. Don't try to get out until they give the all clear. They have snipers trained in this position if you try anything. What? Simon yelled, stunned out of his introspection. What is this, a joke? The driver slowly rolled the divider back up in response. I sat there not knowing what to think. A soldier clad in all black came out of a small guardhouse at the entrance. He had an automatic rifle in his hands, the finger on the trigger. He walked slowly over and knelt down. I saw him talk to the driver, but I didn't know what they said. A moment later, he pressed a button and the 20 foot tall metal gate began to slowly roll to the side. I have a bad feeling about this, I said as he drove us inside. Haley and Simon both looked pale, their eyes wide and terrified as if we were entering a war zone. A garage door opened in the sleek, metallic black surface of the towers. They looked like giant, dark lighthouses looming overhead, except they had no windows and no lights. However, dozens of spotlights were placed at the top of the fences and guard towers. At night, I figured this place would be more lit up than a football stadium at night. The driver drove into the garage. A sudden darkness overcame us. The doors unlocked with a clicking sound. He rolled down the divider. Get out. He said abruptly. Now, we didn't hesitate. I pulled open the door. I was still somewhat excited to see this new revolutionary rehab unit. The razor wire and automatic rifles had given me quite a bit of pause, but perhaps they kept convicted criminals here in a different unit. The more I thought about that, the more sense it made. I began to relax. The driver rolled up his window and wouldn't talk to us anymore. The garage door behind him stayed closed. No one came to greet us. I saw a door nearby. Dim light came through at the bottom. Figuring that we could find someone who worked here over there, I walked over and pushed it open. Haley and Simon followed close behind me. Bright fluorescent lights streamed down over a disgusting mold-filled hallway that disappeared far in front of us in a straight line. I saw patches of black mold rising like hair from the soggy floorboards. Splintering doors stood lining both sides of the hallway, some of them hanging off their hinges and others laid out flat on the floor. Ew, what the hell is this? Haley said, a genuine look of disgust crossing her face. Simon pointed to the door. Hey, there's something nailed to the door, he said. A piece of paper, I looked and saw he was right. I quickly walked over to it and pulled it off. It had what looked like splatters of red across the front. I took it, frowning as I read the yellowed, ancient looking sheet aloud to our little group. Rules to survive in Grey Path 1. Do not sleep in the comfortable room filled with soft moss and poppies 2. If you see the hobo with a mouth across his stomach, you must kill him 3. Stay away from the patients in the delirium tremens ward Anything they see comes true 4. If you hear the hymns of the needle freak over the speakers, it means they have gotten out and you must hide Grey Path Simon asked, curious Is that the name of this place? If you read the contract you guys signed, you would already know that. Haley said, looking closer at the scrap of paper. Is that blood? She had noticed the dark red stain sunk into the ancient paper. Hey, guys, I asked, feeling nervous again. Does anybody know you're here? Like family or friends or anything? They both shook their heads. My family hasn't talked to me in a couple years. Haley admitted sheepishly. Same, Simon grunted. I nodded. Same here, I said, thinking. Do you think that's why they chose us? Because no one would notice were missing. A look of horror crossed both their faces as they stood there. Like, 
Did you even tell any of your friends? Either of you guys? I, I don't actually have any friends, Simon admitted sheepishly, rubbing the back of his hair. Haley just shook her head. Actually, like Simon, I didn't really have any friends anymore. My addiction had sent them all away. Hell, I had given everything away. As I looked back, a deep sense of regret and remorse filled my soul. We started walking down the hallway, avoiding the largest patches of yellow and black mold that sprouted like bushes from the soggy wood. A smell like decomposing meat and mushrooms filled the area. Haley wrinkled her nose. The hallway turned at a 90 degree angle. It felt like we had been walking down it for at least 15 minutes. It was mind boggling how big this place was. I didn't realize it when we pulled in, but the black towers I saw must have extended quite a few thousands of feet into the hills. Why would someone build a place this big? Simon asked, looking around with an inquisitive eye. And why would they let the hallways rot and grow soggy like this? It doesn't make any. A deep, choking sob cut him off. It came from around the corner. Hello? Haley called out. I grabbed her shoulder, hissing in her ear. Shh, I said. What do you think you're doing? Whoever it is already knows we're here, she said. She started slowly tiptoeing forward to peek around the corner. A massive, dirty figure ran straight into her, knocking hard into the wall. She smacked her head hard. It made a hollow bonking sound, like a coconut being dropped on a concrete floor. She stumbled and fell to the ground. She started crawling away as I looked up at the abomination sprinting at me and Simon. Blood streamed from a gash on her forehead. She looked dazed and confused, but I had no time to check on Haley. The eldritch creature wore tattered rags around his shoulders and his waist. His head nearly scraped the ceiling, about eight feet above our heads. I saw blood stains and dried, yellowish pus all over his skin. Deep, necrotic black spots were eaten into his flesh, forming deep circular patches across his skin like the blast holes of a nuclear war. Purplish streaks went out in all directions from the infected wounds, running across his bodies like polluted streams. He turned his face towards us, and I saw a monstrous creature only glimpsed in the wildest of nightmares. In his entirely hairless face, he had one giant eye. It took up the entirety of the front of his head. It rolled in its socket, the pupil large and glassy, the yellow, jaundiced sclera streaked with bloody red veins that stretched outwards like the roots of a tree. His scarred, naked torso had an enormous mouth running across the area where his belly button should have been. The purplish cracked lips formed into a snarl, showing many razor-sharp fangs. They curved inwards like the teeth of a shark. They snapped and bit at the air, the entire stomach and chest rippling and morphing as giant muscles worked furiously under his mutilated skin. An odor of rotten cheese emanated from the creature, mixing with the sickly smell of infection that rose from its decaying flesh. He made a sound like a crying baby, his enormous chest mouth opening with an ear-splitting wail as streams of dirty tears ran down his filthy body. Simon turned and ran. With a predator's instinct, the nightmarish hobo gave chase his naked, bloody feet slapping hard against the soggy floor of the hallway as he sprinted forwards in a blur. Simon frantically tried a random door and disappeared into a room. Roaring, the creature tried to squeeze through the relatively small door. It looked like a cockroach trying to slip through a tiny crack. It worked its body through the threshold, cracking the wood. It smashed its large, scarred hands against the wood. I heard the building shake with every blow and saw deep fissures running through the wall. I turned, looking for Haley. We needed help if we were going to kill this thing. But realistically, how could we possibly kill it without any weapons? Ten feet down the hallway, a door stood open to a room that glowed with a soft blue light. I walked toward it hesitantly, still hearing the cacophony the creature made as it chased Simon. Haley, I whispered sharply. Where are you? I saw drops of blood leading into the room from when she had hit her head. I followed them like a trail of breadcrumbs. Beyond the threshold, I saw a beautiful scene. Layer after layer of soft, green moss covered the floor. From the ground, unnaturally large opium poppies extended up to the ceiling. They swayed slightly, as if a non-existent breeze blew through the room. A sweet, earthy smell radiated from their beautiful pink and white flowers. I felt a sense of calmness and relaxation come over me. A sense of tiredness came over my mind. My eyelids began to droop. Then I saw Haley laying on the ground, asleep. 
All around her, large, tick-like bugs skittered and ran. Each was the size of a baseball. They took turns biting Haley at areas of exposed skin, latching onto her and sucking her blood. A few had already grown fat and changed from a jet black to a dark red. I looked in horror at Haley's pale face. No, I screamed, running forwards. I began ripping them off her body, a sense of adrenaline coming over me. It instantly banished any thought of sleep. Haley's eyes fluttered open as drops of blood flew from the creature's mouths. I ripped them off one by one. After I had gotten nearly a dozen of them off her, she stood up, dripping blood from countless bite marks. Her face looked pale and her lips slightly blue. She wavered on her feet, trembling. I thought she might pass out and I held her arm tightly. Get out of here. I whisper shouted at her. The monstrous black tick still circled us, trying to crawl up on our legs and bite us. I kept kicking on them and stomping them. Their bodies exploded under my shoe like a water balloon filled with dark, clotted blood. Haley and I started to turn when a silhouette filled the doorway. The hobo leered at us inside the room of moss and poppies. He had Simon's decapitated head in one of his filthy hands, the long, dirty nails of his finger biting deeply into Simon's bloodless, white skin. He threw it at us, hitting me hard in the chest and knocking the air out of my lungs. I screamed, looking down at Simon's cyanotic flesh and sightless, staring eyes. His blue lips were pressed together as if in an expression of disappointment approval. I felt more of the ticks trying to climb up my legs. As the hobo began trying to smash his way through the doorway into the room, getting stuck just like he did before, a desperate idea came to me. I picked up one of the tick creatures, holding it gingerly by its sides. It tried to snap and bite at me like an angry cobra, but I quickly threw it at the hobo's eye. The tick soared through the air in a graceful arc, landing on the hobo's face. Its black, spider-like legs writhed, twisting around the back of his head. The hobo's arms were held back by the door and his body was wedged in the threshold. He screamed as the tick went for his eye. The hobo tried to close the massive lid but the tick's probing mouth parts punctured through. A waterfall of vitreous fluid and blood streamed down the hobo's face. In a panic, the hobo pulled forwards into the room, taking half of the wall with him. It cracked and fell apart with a sound like collapsing bricks. Haley and I took the opportunity to sprint through one of the newly formed gaps and into the hallway. Blind, the hobo spun in circles as the ticks surrounded him, crawling up his legs and chest. He smashed himself over and over, using his large, scarred hands to splatter their insectile bodies all over his skin and the surrounding walls, but more came. Soon, he fell down, wailing with noises like a frantic baby under the army of dozens of enormous, mutated ticks. Haley and I ran down the hallway, seeing Simon's decapitated body laying over the threshold of the room he had tried to hide in. With the dying wails of the hobo following us, we fled that pit of horrors, only to find that we hadn't gone nearly far enough. We found a staircase and began climbing. We didn't know where we were going but we figured if the bottom floor was terrible, perhaps the topmost floor was significantly better. The stairs went up 15 stories. The rusted rails had fallen off and deep cracks like the fault lines of an earthquake ran through the concrete steps. They looked like they were getting ready to crumble into dust. We opened the door to the top floor. It gave a loud shriek of rusted metal. I winced, glancing down the hallway. It looked like an apocalyptic hospital ward. The white walls yellowed with age and stained with drops of dark, ancient blood. Smashed windows looked in on empty units with rolling beds. Many had pieces of human skin or deep layers of gore caking their surfaces. A cacophony of white noise emanated from speakers above our heads. A hissing of static shattered the silence. Haley and I both jumped. Then a diseased, raspy voice began to sound over the ancient speaker system of the hospital ward. A lunatic god stares down, black and cold. We eat the bodies of the weak and old. We change ourselves to fit his cries, feeling as our humanity slowly dies. We know that we are dead and weak, and so we all sing the hymns of the needle freak. Oh God, not again, Haley whispered, her eyes filled with horror. What's going to happen this time? I grabbed her hand, hissing in her ear. Run, run. We need to get out of the hallway, I said as doors slammed open all up and down the hospital wards. I saw dozens of walking corpses slumped forwards, shambling and dragging their broken 
broken bodies slowly behind them. Some had marks of car accidents, such as the first young man I saw with pieces of his leg bones sticking out through his skin and a deep gash through his skull. Others looked like they had died of overdoses, some of them still having needles sticking out of their arms. Haley and I chose a random ward, crashing through the door. Empty infant cribs stood all around us. Some had tiny, blood-stained clothes still in the cribs. I saw another door in the back, hanging off its hinges. I ran through, finding myself in a private room. A man stood there without eyes, the empty sockets bare and open like two silently screaming mouths. Oh my god, what happened to you? Haley screamed, backing up quickly. I looked at the sign above the door with a growing sense of horror. It read, Delirium Tremens Ward. They kept coming, he said in a robotic dead voice. The spiders crawling on the floors, the dead baby crawling on the ceiling. My son, he died, you see, crib death. I was too drunk to check on him at the time. Didn't find him for 12 hours, but here, he's, he stopped, inhaling deeply. They're all here. I felt their claws on me. I saw his blue lips as his head spun around 180 degrees and he showed me a mouthful of needles a mouthful of needles he trailed off clawing at his hair with dirty hands i had to take out my eyes to stop seeing i couldn't keep seeing it i couldn't reality is ripping at the seams the eyeless man continued his gouged out socket slowly dribbling blood down his cheeks like crimson tears it's ripping and i have nothing to hold on to now my son won't stop watching me with those dead black eyes of his please make it stop as he spoke, I saw something crawling above us on the ceiling. I looked up, seeing a dead baby. He clung to the ceiling like a spider, hanging upside down. His stiff limbs reached forward, dragging himself along and wailing. His head began to spin around until it was completely backwards. The skin on its neck spiraled around in a sickening way. The baby gave a hiss like a snake. Its pure black eyes flew open, and it showed a mouth filled with thousands of black needles that shimmered like obsidian under the flickering fluorescent lights. Haley walked forwards calmly, putting her hand on the man. From the room full of cribs I heard shuffling and groaning. The corpses were nearing. Your baby has found a way out. Haley said comfortingly, a door. Can you see it? It leads to beautiful, rolling hills and open fields filled with flowers. The man's face seemed to slacken. I looked behind us, seeing a dead, naked man approaching. He had black, garish stitches running down his chest, and countless scars from shooting drugs all over his arms. Behind him, dozens more corpses writhed and shambled towards us. We were running out of time. A door, the eyeless man said. I don't. Yes, see it. Haley encouraged him. It's a big door, and your baby can go through it and find peace. Do you see it? The man hesitated. I saw a door appearing in the wall nearby, slowly phasing into view. The baby's head finished spinning so that its neck was now hyperextended 360 degrees. Then it gave a triumphant cry and skittered towards the door like a centipede chasing a prey. Beyond the threshold of the door, I saw the forests of New England. The sun beat down, natural and beautiful, unlike all this horrible flickering fluorescent light. I grabbed Haley's hand and ran through the door. It closed behind us with a popping sound. We found ourselves in the middle of the woods. We began walking and discovered a trail, which eventually took us to a road. A couple hours later, we found a town. Grateful to be alive, we didn't wonder about the fact that we had ended up five hours away from where we started. Haley and I have been sober ever since. I don't know what kind of demonic place we were kidnapped and taken to, but I seriously doubt the government knew anything about it. I tried to find out more information about Grey Path and who ran it, but I couldn't find any evidence even indicating the place existed. After what I saw there, though, I have never had an easier time staying sober. Dealing with the horrors and nightmares of Grey Path, seeing the walking corpses in the end stages of addiction, it changed me in a fundamental way. I no longer have any desire to use drugs, and God willing, I will never, ever relapse again.